Hello and welcome back to Water Child Tarot. My name is Sarah and thank you for joining me on a video that I've been wanting to make for quite a while, um, but I needed to chew on my thinking about this topic a little bit and figure out how to um, express it in a clear and gentle way. Um, so um, I'm approaching a topic that might be a bit controversial for some people and I want to um, start off by saying that it's not my um, intention here to belittle or to dismiss any any one approach to reading tarot or to learning about tarot, but simply to um, express my own approach to tarot and also to free up um, maybe the sense that there are better or more intelligent ways to go about learning tarot or systems that one should adopt in order to uh, be more master masterful of tarot or to prove some kind of intellectual prowess. Just know that I'm not trying to denigrate anybody's approach, um, but to explain my own approach maybe and my own thinking about certain approaches. I have been thinking a lot about specifically astrology and tarot and how um, lately it seems, maybe in the last year or so, and perhaps born from first an interest in the Thoth tarot um, philosophy in general, and then specifically in this um, Deccan walk thing. Um, that I believe is part of the Crowley system, if you want to call it a system or approach, um, has gotten very popular. And, you know, that's fine. Uh, people should explore and learn and investigate whatever they want to learn and investigate. Um, but what happens with some of these trends in, you know, learning things, everybody's reading the same books, everyone's doing the same practices, there's lots of classes around these things, is it, it begins to feel like prescribed, like required reading. Like, oh, if you're going to be a good tarot reader, you should be learning this too. Not to say anything specifically about Crowley or his approach or any of the modern day teachers that are, that are looking into this, um, but I was thinking about astrological associations with tarot specifically and how that's really never made sense to me. Um, and I think what it boils down to is that astrology is a fixed system and tarot is a random system. And it's never been explained to my satisfaction how these two things can be reconciled, how they can be effectively used together. Um, what I mean by astrology is a fixed system is that even though there's, you know, uh, various schools of astrology or various approaches to um, assigning characteristics, traits, and values to planets, um, to calculating someone's birth chart, um, or to interpreting astrological signs, uh, each of those systems is entirely predictive, right? We can, uh, through mathematical models, we can predict exactly the movement of the planets and the stars in the sky at any particular time. And we have the ability um, through these calculations and historical information, we can go back in time and say, oh, you know, he, this famous person had this chart and therefore it influenced their personality. And, you know, here's how their astrological assignment played out throughout their lifetime, et cetera, et cetera. Or we can project for ourselves in the future. Um, these things. And, and I will say that I like astrology myself. I have an astrologer that I consult um, usually once a year around my birthday time. And so I'm not denigrating astrology at all as a system. I think it can be quite interesting and insightful. Um, but just knowing that it is all fixed and it is all predictable, I can tell you what today is going to be like. I can tell you what tomorrow is going to be like next week, next year. I can tell you what astrologically is going to be going on um, every day for the rest of my, you know, average lifespan um, if I wanted to. And 
So that's great. But then with tarot, what we do is, or at least what I do, um, is we randomize. You know, we shuffle the cards. We ask a question, we shuffle the cards, we randomize as much as possible, and then we pick random cards and lay them out. And so how then does something like uh, the planet Jupiter in the sign of Pisces as associated with a tarot card. I don't even know if that's an association, by the way. I, I don't have that memorized because it, it's not important to me. Um, but let's say we draw a card and it says Jupiter and Pisces um, along with whatever the tarot card is. How does that help me if Jupiter isn't in Pisces on that day when I do that reading or whatever? Um, I hope I'm kind of explaining this clearly. I don't understand how those two pieces of information go together. Um, and so I personally don't use any astrological associations in my own tarot reading style. And I never have. Um, and the other system, well, there's a couple of other systems that are also um, in this Neoplatonic uh, Hermetic discipline. Um, such as alchemy, such as certain forms of Kabbalistic mysticism, um, certain approaches to chakra energies, and there's probably some others um, that fall into these patterns uh, that also get placed on tarot. And again, those all are either fixed and predictable or they're linear. Um, Things like Kabbalah, you know, you're going from one state to another, or alchemy, you're going from one state to another, and it's a process of refinement that is prescribed. There are procedures for working through certain processes. Um, and whether you take that as literal, um, you know, some kind of scientific procedure that alchemists uh, would have gone through in centuries past, or whether you take a metaphorical approach and it's something more about like molding your personality or developing your sense of self or uh, digging into your spiritual process or or personal magical gnosis um, it seems more sort of linear and iterative to me than again the completely random thing of tarot which is what Tarot's strength is. Um, tarot's strength is that it's random, that it's not pre-assigned, that it's not fixed, that one card in a situation might not mean the same thing if that same card comes up for a different kind of reading, um, that it's flexible, that it adapts to what's being asked, who's asking, um, what kind of mood we're in when we ask, and all of these things. And so that's something that I wanted to explore today in imagery and assignment, and um, just kind of start a conversation about. And I'm curious if other people feel just as perplexed, stymied, or uh, befuddled by some of the common approaches to tarot as I do, I, I'm wondering, you know, am, am I in the minority, the vast minority, or um, are there more of you out there that kind of don't understand these overlays onto tarot that have become so popular? I know there are a few, you know, Tom Benjamin kind of rants about this a bit, um, and, you know, perhaps some others um, that have written books or, or taught on things um, and it's not to say that I don't overlay something on tarot, so I'll show you, I'll show you some examples in a second. We'll go down and look at some cards. Um, and I do overlay certain associations on tarot, but it's different than assigning fixed, linear, or prediction kind of systems. And I guess that's where I would differentiate those two. Um, hopefully I'm describing this well. And let's look at some specific decks and kind of do 
a tour of tarot history to look at this a little bit further. All right, so in the beginning, um, back in the 1400s, you had first playing cards that came over from China through the Middle East into North Africa, the Mamluk culture, and then into Europe, specifically Italy and parts of Spain. And I believe, um, just through my own research and kind of maybe consensus history that I've read, um, that early the earliest tarot would have looked like these. They would have been very basic, very plain, um, just given what we know of sort of printmaking history, um, this would have been kind of the technology that was available at the time. And so here I have two different examples of reproductions of early tarots. This one is the uh, Cherokee Rosenwald, and this is a redrawn version by Heather Hall. Um, you can see here that the cards are very plain, they're not numbered, and they're not titled. Um, we know who these are based on what they're holding and what their pose might be. Um, but basically, they're playing cards, and that's what tarot was in the beginning. We had Mamluk playing cards that had, you know, a 1 through 10, and then I can't remember if they had two quarts or three, um, but they were just symbolic cards uh, because the um, Mamluk... Um, culture was Islamic. Um, they did not have figures on the cards. That's considered sacrilege. Um, so they just would have had geometric representations like this. Um, but then as this uh, playing card thing came into Europe, we transitioned into having figures on the cards. But again, nothing, nothing on the cards to rank them or to assign a number other than the cards that had a certain number of objects. So this would be the um, Seven of Swords card, for example. This would be Justice, but she's not numbered. Okay, so you had the four suits of the playing cards, and then we added these tarot uh, cards to them as a separate suit of trumps. And even the number of trumps in the original decks is a little bit debated, um, but it was probably 21 at least it could have been 22. Um, in the Rosenwald deck, we don't have a full card, um, an original full card. So we're not sure if 100% if there was a full card. Um, but we have everybody else. And the trumps would have all been a single value, and they would have been used as the top ranking cards in this game of cards. The other thing that we did not have in these early decks is any kind of elemental or numerological association. So again, this was just used for gambling, for playing trick-taking games, and that kind of thing. And in the Minkiati, which is what I have here, it's an expanded deck that also had separately astrological cards. So there certainly wouldn't have been any astrological associations in the earliest tarot decks because you had, if you had those, you had them as separate cards. So each um, astrological sign has a card in this deck. Here's Pisces, for example. Um, I think that would be Virgo, Cancer, um, Aries, Capricorn, and so on. And then you also had elemental cards. This is the Earth card from this deck. So they would not have had elemental associations either. Um, Again, this was all just uh, popular imagery of the time and um, playing cards used for betting games. Okay, so that's the that's the origins. And then I did want to show off the Spook Hestera, which has different designs. Now, these do have trumps that have numbers on them, but they're not the numbers that we have today. So there was no fixed, uh, when you do get numbered cards, there was no fixed assignment of what those numbered values were in early tarot decks. For example, here we have the Hermit, who is numbered 11 instead of the traditional, what we have traditionally now, which is 9. Again, very basic design. And if I can get to another card, 
and we have the devil is um, is 14 instead of 15. Now in looking at the patterns of these pip cards, you'll also notice that there isn't a fixed um, pattern that's exactly like the Terre de Marseille. So even in assigning value or qualities to cards based on the way that the pips are arranged, is it's not standardized in the early days of tarot, again, because these were used just for gambling and betting. Um, there was no esoteric or magical or whatever you want to call it associations with these cards. And that's not to say that any assignment of those qualities is not legitimate, but I would argue that no particular system is more legitimate than another. And I guess that's really what the point of this whole video is, is to say that you can assign whatever values, qualities, or interpretations to cards that you would like that makes sense to you, and you don't have to follow an established system that someone else has dictated. Um, some people think that the Visconti Sforza was the very first tarot deck. I would argue that it's it's likely that a luxury version of the everyday deck came in later, uh, slightly later, so that these had been around for a decade or two before um, these luxury versions were commissioned. This is this would have been hand painted and gilded and all that stuff. And I don't think the person or or artists that developed uh, these Visconti decks invented tarot. Um, I think this is a concept that had been around for a little while. And then the Duke of Milan said, you know, I want a fancy version to give as a gift or to show off in my home um, and that sort of thing. But here again, while, so, you know, this deck has assigned what's traditionally used as the numbering system uh, for tarot kind of in the margin here, you'll notice that the original artwork doesn't have any numbers. So there's no number for the judgment card. There's no number for the world card. They're just the trumps. Um, they're the fifth suit and they go with the other suits. And again, these would probably have been used more for display or contemplation or um, showing off, you know, at parties with your friends. Look, look how beautiful uh, and how much money I paid to have gilt cards made just for me. Um, aren't I fancy and special? Right? That's what these would have been used for, not even gameplay, because they would have cost a lot of money to have someone uh, hand paint with, you know, um, handmade paints and um, real gold. Uh, it would have cost a lot of money, so you wouldn't have risked damaging these um, in kind of backroom card play. But I don't think that they would have had a particular religious or philosophical significance either. I think they were just the fancy version of cards. And it was really, you know, an art piece, a trophy, um, a status symbol. We start to move forward in time. Um, different people start to get hold of old tarot decks and we start to see the first associations coming out. Um, now, what I appreciate about teachers like Tom Benjamin and Camille Elias um, and Yoav Ben Dov is that they talk, when they, when they talk about associating qualities to tarot cards, they talk about functionality. Um, what is justice and what does that mean for you and how does that reflect it in what this card will do in a reading? How it will answer a question? Um, what do coins do? You know, th this is the method of transaction. This is wealth. This is, you know, buying favors or buying uh, goods or services. What do cups do? Well, they hold liquid. They're used in um, ecclesiastical and religious ceremonies. Um, they can be used for baptism, they can use to be used to anoint um, and wash away sin and, you know, all of those kinds of things. What are swords for? Swords are for cutting, beheading, um, fighting off something, standing your ground. 
And then what are batons for? Or what are wands for? Um, I want to call these batons because, uh, or staves, um, because that's, that's, you know, in the French and the Italian, that's what these would have been. Clubs, um, you know, they're used to beat people. They're used to uh, make a fence or put up posts uh, for a post and beam structure. You know, we're talking about wooden sticks here. So what do you do with wooden sticks? Um, and that's an, you know, taking an early look at tarot and those kinds of associations. And then by extension, um, associations with, again, roles in society. So what role does a king fill versus what role does a knight or a cavalier fill? What role does a valet or a page fill? And what roles do each of the trumps fill? Here we have Juno instead of the high priestess or the Pope S. And so she fills a very different role than either of those other two characters. You know, what is what is a hermit's qualities and what does that mean um, in terms of a reading? Not Not what astrological symbol is the hermit associated with, um, but what are hermits like? What do they do? What do they provide? Or um, how do they function with other kinds of people in society? You know, and here you get someone who is uh, a devotee, someone who is removed from society, someone who, um, you know, in Victorian times uh, would have been paid to provide an atmospheric um idea almost like a theme park character of you know oh we have this beautiful garden and we have yeah we have a cave down at the bottom of the garden and a hermit lives there you know and you can go visit them so they're or or like a, a disney figure you know that kind of thing um what is a what does a hanged man do well he doesn't do much but what's being done to him he's being punished why is he being punished um you start to look into that and then you can get um, associations with that and you can use that to do your readings. We keep moving through time and then the French esotericists and eventually English esotericists get hold of tarot packs like this and they start assigning all kinds of significance to um, the geometry of the cards, the coloration of the cards, the, uh, the way the poses are, and overlaying um, values onto the cards. Um, you know, this isn't just a woman wrestling with a lion, but now the lion represents her inner lust that she has to overcome, and blah, 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 blah. Um, and it goes on and on. And eventually you get representational decks that have more imagery, like the ubiquitous and never familiar Rider Waite Smith system. And so from your baseline esotericism, uh, French esotericism and so forth, you get the Golden Dawn, which assigns very specific values um, to each of the cards. Now, I don't have a Golden Dawn deck anymore. I used to have a reproduction deck, um, but they're, uh, you know, they assigned a keyword and a value to each card. And from that keyword and value, they had certain imagery. And then from that Golden Dawn system, you get people like Wait and then Crowley after him assigning even more specificity um, based on their own interpretations, their uses and their goals for uh, spirituality in general or mysticism in general. Wait was a Christian mystic and he had his own set of goals that were different from uh, ultimately what the Golden Dawn was trying to get at. And so he came up with this deck as a, as a tool um, for practicing magic and for practicing um, mysticism in the way that he thought it should be correctly done and assigned uh, values, um, assigned elemental values and assigned um, those the golden dawn keywords um, to each of the images and then illustrated um, or had Pamela Coleman Smith illustrate uh, each of those concepts in her artwork. And some of them hew quite closely to the Golden Dawn, and then he, you know, varies things. Um, famously, you know, he makes the switcheroo between um, the position of justice and strength in the numbering system of the majors because he wanted to assign uh, this strength card to Leo because it had a lion on it, um, and then he wanted justice to be assigned to Libra because it has scales. And while visually that makes sense to me, um, you know, I use a different kind of numerology in my own uh, system of reading tarot, 
um, which is Pythagorean, and not Kabbalistic or astrological. And so eights um, would not go with a personality type like a Leo for me. Um, it's a mismatch. And that's one of the reasons why um, I sort of balk at astrology, uh, because you know, it doesn't match up with my own understanding of numerology. So, um, but you know, each each to his own. Wade did this, and it's very popular today, um, and still resonates with a lot of people. And again, it's not that it's invalid. It served Wade's uh, goals and uh, desires to have a deck that conveyed the concepts that were important to him. So it's not something that is wrong or incorrect. Um, but it is just one person's ideas, and it's not any more valid than any other set of associations that we might care to make with the tarot cards. Um, and then again, I don't have a copy of the Thoth deck with me, um, but Aleister Crowley did the same thing, and he, you know, had even more uh, differences. For example, he renamed certain cards, Strength became Lust, and temperance became art, and so on and so forth. And so that continues to develop, um, and then you get, you know, in the, in the 60s and the 70s, there's been an explosion of kind of New Age approach, approaches and even more uh, different kinds of esoteric association. This um, is the Tarot Balbi, and it uses a different system altogether. Um, it, it is Kabbalistic and astrological, and so you'll see astrological symbols in here um, associated with the different cards, but you'll also see some Kabbalah, and you'll also see um, these Picard, this Picard pattern of the pips, which um, is not it's not like the Rider Waite Smith or the Golden Dawn deck, and it's also not like the uh, Marseille deck either. It's got its own kinds of associations, and you have this below above thing going on in a lot of the cards. You'll see that there's like a, a curved horizon, and then the bottom part of the card will have a different color or a different arrangement than the top. Um, there it is again, and sometimes it's kind of subtle, and other times it's you know very obvious. Um, you'll also see the Hebrew letters, and things uh, on here. And it's interesting to me that, again, the associations, um, this is also a Kabbalistic, this number 30, and I can't remember exactly um, how that fits in, but uh, you'll notice that these associations are not the same as other Kabbalistic decks because um, people can't agree which letter of the Hebrew alphabet to start on. Um, and you know, is the fool at the beginning or are they at the end of the majors and that kind of thing. So there's no co cohesive, you know, set system um, for how any of this comes together. And it really is, you know, each, each person who creates a tarot deck or each person who wants to use a particular deck um, gets to reinterpret these things on their own. And for something like this, you know, I, I have this in my collection just because it's um, historic deck from the 70s, and it's got really cool bright colors. Um, I'm not at all interested in the Kabbalistic or the astrological associations that, you know, uh, Senor Balbi uh, put in here. I just like the artwork, so I ignore all this stuff. Um, someone else might say, you know, no, I want to use this because I like the esoteric um, associations with these arrangements of pips, and you know what the Picard system uh, offers or gives me um, is really important and it informs my reading style or it informs the way that I use these cards for um, you know some kind of manifestation, magical working, um, or you know spiritual investigation, however you're using this. So and again any of those things are valid uh, if they're if they're valuable to you um, but it's not a given you know this this person um, Domenico Balbi uh, made this deck according to his own needs, thoughts, um, and you know viewpoint on the tarot um, and teachings that he had learned, and it does it neither validates nor invalidates any other system that's out there. And as we move through into 
you know, modern times, we can continue to see the way that um, tarot has evolved and how artists have brought it up to date and made it more relatable. Um, this is the Inspired Soul Tarot from Julie of the Peekaboo Rose YouTube channel. And she's brought um, personal craft and uh, wine tasting into her deck. And so these are like everyday activities that we might engage in. Drinking wine, um, doing crafts, and being creative, writing, um, you know, uh, dealing with familiar objects um, in our lives, and how that all manifests as real-world experiences, and how that can inform um, our use of the cards, and, and how that can help answer questions for us. Um, I really like this deck for that reason. It's approachable, and um, it's very open. So, you know, you can interpret the cards, um, look for visual rhymes, look for color and shapes and different cues um, to do your readings. Um, and you can see here that Julie has added in the elemental associations again. So that's an overlay. Um, but again, I, you know, I like um, and I understand what Julie was going for in how she came up with this deck and why she chose the images that she chose. And so for me, it's very relatable. Um, it may not work for other people and that's okay too. Another frequently offered kind of uh, tarot deck would be something that does hew to the writer weight in terms of certain imagery, but again, updates and modernizes it for our own uh, tastes and experiences and takes it a little bit out of the um, sort of symbolic magical realm and more into the practical kind of self-help uh, personal guidance um, realm and the fifth spirit tarot I think is a great example of that um, so again you have elemental associations here um, and you have just pips or scenic pips here that they do to some degree hew to the Rider Waite Smith or Golden Dawn uh, keywords but are open enough that you can dissociate that if you'd like and um, you can kind of uh, interpret these images in a slightly more open way. I find that they're very easy to read because the people are very relatable. Again, I would suggest that this would be me. This is kind of my body type. Uh, that's what I would look like in a pair of shorts and a tank top and hiking boots. And you know, this person's um, got all their stuff on their, on their back, uh, including their pentacle, and they're ready to set out on their adventure. And they look like they're you know, sturdy, um, and they have they have the world open in front of them. So, you know, here I am interpreting these cards, but um, <laughs> it's relatable, um, it's modern, it gives you that open sense of being able to ter interpret the cards. You know, if you if you feel like the Rider Waite Smith is helpful. Um, you can certainly draw a line from these back to Pamela Coleman Smith's original offerings, but you're bringing in um, modern imagery. You're certainly bringing in a more inclusive depiction of the spectrum of humanity. Um, this is an intentionally queer and uh, trans affirming deck, um, and it depicts people with you know, different body shapes, different skin tones, different ethnicities, different ages, um, different uh, physical abilities, you know, all these different things. And so in that way, it makes tarot more accessible again, um, because it doesn't lean so heavily into the Golden Dawn um, system of esoteric magical manifestation, which um, for a lot of us is not really relatable and it's not really our goal. We have some other spiritual path we're on and we just like to use tarot for tarot readings, um, not necessarily for meditation or for spiritual, spiritual development, but um, just for asking questions and doing readings. And so I like that a lot. I think this also could be used for meditation 
or for asking um, per personal spiritual questions. And certainly the guidebook for this leans in that direction. So if you're if you're looking for a deck that does offer um, you know ways to do things like shadow work or to uh, investigate parts of your psyche or you know deal with uh, ego driven reactions to situations and that kind of thing um, you know investigate trauma and try to work with trauma past trauma in your life I think the guidebook is certainly written in that orientation but again um, if those aren't your goals then you could take a deck like this and just use it as you know something that offers you uh, tangible imagery about relatable situations like a dinner party or um, you know somebody leading a protest or your local librarian so that's really what I'm getting at with this kind of deck and then um, getting away from maybe the everyday relatable uh, we have kind of a final class of deck um, and that's uh, the art deck, you know, the surrealist deck, the completely overhauled, reinterpreted, um, out there kind of imagery that speaks to things like our subconscious, our dreams, uh, our fears, our nightmares, um, you know, our uh, inner psyche, our inner world, and stimulates our imagination, um, stimulates our intuition, and helps us push past um, a lot of the maybe set interpretations or set um, associations that we've learned over time uh, that we have picked up from our early tarot studies and the kinds of things that might feel a bit ingrained um, or cliche in our reading and kind of busts us out of that and helps us rethink um, or reimagine, reinterpret um, when we get a little bit stuck, a little bit tired of the same kinds of images over and over. And I have another video um, about that, looking at this deck with some others um, that use um, imagery that's a little more out there and imagery that's you know, really not hewing to the Marseille, it's not hewing to the Thoth, it's not hewing to the RWS, it's just um, a complete uh, reimagining of uh, what tarot uh, could be. And I really appreciate um, the option to have decks like this in my collection as well, um, because they break me out of ruts and they help me um, not fall into fixed associations with specific cards. So that's really what I wanted to discuss in this video. Um, I hope that that, that was clear, uh, what I was trying to get at in terms of um, breaking away from you know any one particular system, because there is no church of tarot. There is no um, one school of tarot. There is no one true philosophy of tarot. Uh, you know, it is open to interpretation, interpolation, and use um, by anyone for anything, anything you can think of. And you know, I've definitely heard of people who use it in um, psychological evaluation. People who are counselors um, who use it in their counseling practice. I've heard of people who use it in their creative practices for art or writing prompts. Um, you know, people who use it for meditation and path working, people who use it in magical workings and spell work, um, and people who associate decks with a particular uh, divinatory um, or divine um, aspect or divine consciousness or deity. Uh, people who um, use it to write poetry, people who use it to um, answer questions, and that's that's certainly what I use it for, is answering questions. Um, but you could certainly use it in any number of ways. And so I just want to encourage you to think about, if you're feeling uh, pressed 
to fit into something or to learn something um, specifically because it seems like everybody else is doing it or that, that you've gotten this vibe that like it you'll be more intellectually sound if you learn X, Y, and Z. Um, I encourage you to really not feel peer pressure to do those things, but to to learn about tarot and to explore tarot in the ways that you're interested in, um, because there's really no right or wrong, and it is very open and accessible. And I think we're living in a you know a second golden age of tarot where we have you know all these decks with different art and themes and approaches, and there's a tarot deck out there for everybody. Um, and if you're like me and you have eclectic taste, then there's probably lots of tarot decks for you that that speak to you in different ways and you know can be used in different moods or for different kinds of questions or activities. Um, and I think that's just a wonderful gift that we have uh, in this time period. So I'd love to hear um, your thoughts. I'd love to hear what you use tarot for, how you use it, um, or you know, if there's um, specific systems that you like or specific um, systems that maybe you tried that, you know, ended up not being part of your practice, uh, let me know in the comments. Uh, happy to have a discussion as always. And thanks for your time. And I'll see you again very soon with another video.